The Institute for Divorce Financial Analysts, IDFA, is a proud sponsor of Purse Strings. IDFA is the premier organization dedicated to the certification, education, and promotion of the use of financial professionals in the divorce arena. IDFA provides specialized training to accounting, financial, and legal professionals in the field of pre-divorce financial planning. To find out more about earning the Certified Divorce Financial Analyst designation, visit institutedfa.com. Thank you, fearless listeners, and go you for hitting play. Please like and subscribe as it helps us grow. Also, share it with friends as we have to keep talking about this shit. Let's dive in. Coming up on today's edition of Women and Money, the shit we don't talk about, our guest is one of our own Purse Strings Approved professionals, Tracy Conan. Tracy is a forensic accountant and fraud investigator with Sequence Forensic Accounting. So this topic is gonna get real. It is because today we're going to talk about financial abuse and how to find the money when you're going through a divorce. So let's dive in. Gloria Steinem once said, we will never solve the feminization of power until we solve the masculinity of wealth. Barbara Provost and Maggie Nielsen are the team at Purse Strings that will help you navigate the ins and outs of financial independence so that you can be financially fearless. This is Women in Money, the shit we don't talk about. Tracy, great to see you. Glad you're here. So take a minute and introduce yourself to our listeners. I am so happy to be here so we can talk about some shit that people don't like to talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm a forensic accountant and a fraud investigator, so I find money. I work on cases like corporate fraud where executives are stealing money from companies or when companies are fighting over contracts gone bad and somebody lost money and they want to figure out how much was lost and they need an expert witness to testify in court. That's me. And when there are divorce cases where people are concerned about where the money has gone I come in, I find out where that money has gone. That sounds so juicy. (laughs) It is juicy. It is fun. You know, people don't all like to work with numbers, but I do like to work with numbers and I love digging into those details. And I'll go through tens of thousands of transactions to find that smoking gun, find where that money went. Wow. Goodness. (laughs) How now let me just ask you, how did you get into forensic accounting and, and what you're doing? I was a criminology major in college, and my goal was to become a prison warden because I felt like there was some really good stuff that I could do running a prison and helping, you know, to create some sort of positive change there. But my sophomore year in the criminology program, I took an elective that they offered called financial crime investigations. And that was my entree into forensic accounting. I really enjoyed that class. So I started taking accounting classes and got the criminology degree, but with a business minor and got enough credits in accounting to sit for the CPA exam. And voila, here I am. That is so awesome. I can't imagine you as a warden. Sorry. (laughs) I know it is hard to believe people ask how, how on earth was that a thing? And I don't know. I was just always and still am fascinated with prisons. I love watching documentaries about them, about understanding the societies that are created in there and you know, talking about the issues about protecting society versus rehabilitating the offender and how do we accomplish both. So it was something that just has always been an interest of mine. And again, I thought that I could really create some positive change in such a negative circumstance. I love it. And I I, I think that's what you are doing now, but in the divorce sector. Um, so we're excited to have you on, you know, helping people get some change and, you know, call out the bad guy and help the good guy and all that stuff. So to dive in, and I know you explained it a little bit, but like, can you explain what a forensic accountant is and and really what you do? I do fraud investigations, which are focused on tracing money. I will take a lot of bank statements, credit card statements, investment account statements, and I will just follow the money through that system. In a divorce case, that looks like someone has the joint bank account between the husband and wife. That's where all the paychecks go into. 
and I'm looking at, okay, the money went into the account. How does it come out? What are they spending their money on? Some of that is normal, good stuff, like paying the mortgage and the utilities and the car payment. And some of that is bad stuff. It might be a drug addiction or gambling or an affair or buying things that the other spouse didn't know about. And then of course, there's a gray area in between, but I will identify transactions that we think look bad. It might be a $10,000 cash withdrawal that you never knew happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, where did that money go? Or a transfer to a different bank. You bank at Chase and you've always banked at Chase. Mm -hmm. And now I look at your bank statement and I see $20,000 being transferred to Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. We want to get to the bottom of what's going on with Wells Fargo. Wow, that's cool. So I think what you're getting to here is what we sometimes refer to as financial abuse. Um, can you define really what is financial abuse and what does that look like? Financial abuse is dishonesty with the money and controlling. It's really the control of your spouse financially. And that might be uh, by you spending money without your spouse's consent or spending money outside of the agreements that you have with your spouse. Most spouses have some sort of limit for spending, right? Where if we're going to spend more than a thousand dollars on something, we talk about it first. The person committing financial abuse is going to spend without regard to that agreement. They also might do things like control you with the money. They might control the information that you have about the money, keep you in the dark about it. So it can have different facets to how it shows itself, but really it's it's much about control and often about dishonesty with the money. Mm -hmm. We have definitely seen you know, some of the dishonesty that's almost more clear of financial abuse, but this control is really interesting. And I feel like there are some times when women don't even know that financial abuse is going on, but then you take a step back and you really look and you definitely see that control and um, the lack of sharing information. I think that as far as we've come in our society with women, you know, earning money and earning as much or more than their spouse in lots of cases, we still have many, many, many situations where the woman is the lesser earner or the one who is not controlling the budget or both. And when you don't have information, that can lead to abuse. The thing is, there is shame surrounding the issue of, I didn't know what was going on with the money. Mm -hmm. And I am here to help get rid of that shame because I'm telling you, it is very typical that one spouse doesn't know what's going on with the money. We divide and conquer, mm -hmm. you know, you take care of the lawn. I take care of the budget mm -hmm. or you do the cleaning. I shuttle the kids to all their activities. This is what we do in marriages. And so if you haven't been in a position where you have had knowledge about the money or had control over it, that's not uncommon. And it's not something to be ashamed of. Yes. And at Purse Strings, we really encourage women to have conversations about money. Do they have to take on the task of writing the checks and making the deposits? No, but they need to know where the money's at, where the money's flowing, where the bank's statements are, um, whose names are on it, things like that. Joint conversations about how are we saving? How are we spending? What is that limit we need to have a conversation about before we spend? And it should be a common conversation. It shouldn't be a conversation that's wrought with shame, as you say, or anger or um, uncertainty or nervousness. It should be a conversation just like anything else. I'm a big fan of at least once a month having a money talk. But if you could have a short money talk once a week, where are we at on our budget? What are the unusual items of spending that might be coming up? Things like that. The more routine you can make the conversation, the less anxiety there should be around it. That's perfect. And I think for those who have not been part of this conversation before, just because they are used to being on the sidelines, it's not jumping into the conversation and being accusatory, but just being curious. Cause we always say, you know, what if somebody got hit by a bus one day and you just don't know. And so it's not always coming in being accusatory that you're thinking they're doing something wrong, but the fact of now I just want to be part of the conversation and learn what's going on just to be prepared. I found that's one of the easiest ways to start the conversation. If you haven't been talking about money and haven't been involved to talk about 
the fact that I'm concerned. What if something happens to you? I need to know where our money is, how much we have, how the bills are getting paid, what's on auto pay and what's not. Because if you're in the hospital in a coma, the last thing I want to be doing is worrying about whether or not our mortgage is going to get paid this month. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I can't tell you how unfortunately we hear so many stories about women who didn't know. I didn't know. I never wrote a check. I didn't pay the bills. I, I didn't make the investments. I, I, I'm not quite sure of the guy that he used. You know, I, they just don't know. And money is the foundation of many, many, many things. So you really need to step in and, and get engaged. Well, and the conversation of, I'd like to meet our financial advisor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to meet our tax preparer. And I'd like to understand more about these things. It's a great conversation to have. Now, I understand that there are situations where asking to have those introductions or asking to be part of those conversations might be really, really difficult in abusive situations situations where there's excessive control by the spouse, those are hard conversations to have. And I don't want to minimize how mm -hmm. difficult that might be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want people to start thinking about it and start thinking about how could you have that conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are really good tips. And, um, you know, we really want to give women tips, stepping stones, baby steps, like how what, where can they get started? Do you have any advice for them on you know, if they've never approached the conversation before, or if they're in a relationship where there's a lot of control about money, what, what's up, what are some suggestions you might have? If you do have access to your bank accounts and your credit card accounts, the first tip is to go look, go get those statements and start taking a look at them on your own. And you don't have to feel sneaky about doing it. If your name is on an account, you are entitled to have access to it. If you don't have access to it because you don't have the login or the password, you can get a login and password of your own from your bank if your name's on that account. And you're just as entitled to that information as your spouse. So really, it's about gathering information. That's the very first most important step. That's great. The other thing we often say is, if your husband, let's say, is making the income, is have access to his paycheck so you can at least see at some point, whether it's online or in paper, what's the income that's coming through his paycheck? What are the benefits that he's paying for? What kind of insurance is there? There's a lot going on with someone's benefits and pay. That's a fantastic one. And another one is getting your hands on your tax returns. Yeah. And I know not everyone has seen a tax return before or would know how to read it, but I bet you have a friend or a family member you trust who knows a little bit about taxes and could probably sit down with you and walk you through it. Maybe, maybe they just prepare their own taxes. And so they know kind of what the, what the different lines are on the tax return, but it's a great starting point to at least get a base of knowledge about what your financial situation is. Yeah. It's really gathering those numbers, seeing where you're at right now and seeing, you know, does something look really off? I guess, you know, any big red flags laying in there. And even if you don't know if it looks off, you might just not even really know how much do we bring in every year? Mm -hmm. I think just knowing what your income is as a starting point for some people can be a really huge piece of information that they never had before. Yeah, it's an important piece of information that they need to have. So everyone yes. should know that foundationally. Yeah. Okay. So we really hit on the financial abuse, kind of what it looks like. What are some tips? I'd like to switch over to a different topic, and that's the topic of divorce, because I know you work a lot with couples who are divorcing. And tell us why they hire you and what you do for them. When people are getting divorced and one person is suspicious about what's happened with the money, that's when I get involved. And it is typically higher earners who are retaining me because forensic accounting is an expensive undertaking when it comes to divorce. They are potentially looking to find out how much money is my spouse really making? What sources of income do we have? So for the average person who has a traditional paycheck, it's probably not something they need the forensic accountant for. But if you have someone who is self-employed, who has the type of job where their earnings fluctuate wildly from year to year, they get very large bonuses one year, but maybe not the next year. 
They have unusual things like stock options that they're receiving, or maybe you have rental properties. When it gets a little more complicated on the income side, that's when I come in. On the expense side, when we're looking at what have we been spending, I do that as well. We're looking for all those normal expenses because how much have we been paying for the mortgage and the utilities and all those types of things? But there's probably a suspicion that money has been spent inappropriately or has been siphoned off and hidden away. I will go through all of those account statements to try to find where that money has gone. Now, how do you get your hands on all these documents? You know, let's say if a a woman, you know, they weren't, their husband was not providing these documents. As we've mentioned, if your name is on the bank account, you have a right to get those statements. If you can't get online access, you can go to your bank and say, I need my statements and they have to provide them to you. Uh, Your tax records, you can go directly to the IRS and get your tax records all on your own. So if your name is attached to something, you have a right to get it yourself. But if for some reason you still can't get it, or if we're talking about accounts that don't have your name on them, Those records will be obtained through the legal process of divorce. Your attorney will send a subpoena to the bank and the bank has to provide the documents. And a subpoena is a really routine part of divorce. It's just a legal document that says, hello, bank, there's a lawsuit, it's a divorce, and you are required to provide all the records for any accounts in the spouse's names. Good to know. Wow. So I bet you have some juicy stories around things that you may have found while doing this work. I have juicy stories. I also have really run-of-the-mill sounding stories. Like one divorce that I was working on in the Chicago area, I was going through all of their spending because the wife was suspicious that something was going on. And I wasn't finding a whole lot that really concerned me. And that happens sometimes. We don't find too much that that looks out of the ordinary because the spouse who's hiding money is pretty good at hiding his tracks. Well, I came across in this case, a check written out to a utility company in Arizona. Hmm. And I asked the wife, why would you be paying a utility company in Arizona? And I was expecting her to say, maybe we have a vacation home. Or sometimes I hear things like, we paid a utility bill for my in-laws or something like that. Someone you know, needed us to spot them some money. And she said, I have no idea why we would pay something in Arizona. We have nothing out there. there. That makes no sense at all. Through a series of other things in the case, we ended up deciding that it would be a good idea to get a private investigator involved. Long story short, the husband had purchased a property in Arizona. Once it was found out, of course, he called it the rental property. And you could probably guess that it wasn't really a rental property. It was a condo for his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had established a bank account to pay the bills for that property at the same bank that they had their joint account at. One time, he accidentally wrote the check for the electric bill out of their joint account instead of his other account. So we ended up discovering that property which we probably never would have discovered otherwise. That was the only hint that there was something out there that we should be looking for. Wow. That was one little slip up. (laughs) I always say they, they almost always mess up somehow. They, people forget that when they're trying to hide money, that they leave hints behind. And that's my job to find those clues. Like little tracks. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. So, When you engage with them, are you part of the legal slash financial team? Are you working with one spouse, not the other? How does it all work? I usually work with one spouse because the cases that I get involved in are typically pretty contentious. There is no agreeing between the spouses. Occasionally, the spouses will say, hey, we've got a bunch of money on the line here in this divorce. We want this to get sorted out properly. Instead of us each hiring a forensic accountant and incurring that cost, let's agree on one forensic accountant. We'll each pay for half and have the work done. But most of the time I'm working for one side. I'm usually working for the person who hasn't been in control of the money and has the suspicions. Although sometimes I am working on the side of the person who has been accused of hiding money, who says, These accusations have been made. I need someone to help me prove that there's no money missing. I am typically brought in by the divorce attorney because divorce attorneys have worked with forensic accountants before and have a network of them, know who might be good for a particular case. And I will 
come in, talk with the attorney, the client, understand what the concerns are, understand if there have been any red flags that they've seen or any instances of hidden money that they've already found. So we kind of have a starting point. And then it's a matter of getting all those bank statements, credit card statements, investment account statements, tax returns, and me digging into those details and looking for those little clues. Wow. How, how long do you typically spend like with one client? It could be a while. It could be if the case goes on and on and on. But if someone came to me and they already had all the financial documents I need already in hand, I typically will uh, look at their case, do my work, write an expert report within about 60 days. Wow. This kind of seems really interesting and kind of fun to get into. I mean, it's no fun that you're searching through someone's divorce, but it also sounds like a really kind of exciting puzzle. I really love what I do. And I look at it like a puzzle. I'm putting together pieces of a puzzle. And sometimes I feel guilty that I enjoy my work so much because I realize that it comes, you know, in the midst of someone else's trauma. And, you know, divorce is one of the most difficult things someone can go through. And, you know, it breaks my heart for them. But at the same time, the idea that I can help someone understand their finances, get clarity and know once and for all what has happened to their money that brings me a lot of joy. Now, we do know that not everyone can afford you. Uh, True. So what is it that you have for the regular person who really wants to know where the money is, but they can't afford to work with you? I created the Divorce Money Guide for the 95% of people who aren't going to hire a forensic accountant. Anyone who hasn't been in control of the money and needs to know what's happened and needs to know where do I start with this can use the divorce money guide all the way up to those who say, I know my, my spouse is hiding money. The divorce money guide is an online handbook that offers videos, PDFs, worksheets, checklists to help walk you through. First of all, what is this financial part of the divorce and what's going to happen? So we talk about the subpoenas and all the other fancy legal terms that relate to the financial stuff so that you know what to expect. Then we go into red flags of fraud. And how would you know if something you're seeing is a sign that there's shenanigans with the money? Then what are the financial documents you need? How do you get them? And what do you look for in them once you have them? And anyone, even people who aren't good with numbers can use the divorce money guide. Yeah. Even when you know, I took a look through it, even though I'm not getting divorced. Um, it was amazing how thorough it was and all the great tips in there. I was like, wow, that she's got she got everything in here that you need. And some of the tips, once I tell it to you, you're like, that's not really that complicated, but I hadn't thought of it before. So, yeah. dear listeners, I will give you a great example. You look at your bank statement and you see a payment every month to Citibank. And you know that you have a Citibank credit card. So that makes sense to you, right? What about when you start seeing two payments to Citibank every month? What does that mean? He's paying twice on your credit card bill to pay that credit card down. No. You, <laughs> you could think that. A lot of people might think that. And I don't think that that's a, that's a bad guess at all. But it is possible that there is a second Citibank credit card that you never knew about that has the secret spending on it. So we're looking for unusual things like that. I mean, I, I give tips like, let's take a year's worth of bank statements, go through with a yellow highlighter, highlight every paycheck that is deposited. And when you're done with that year's worth of bank statements, go back and count how many paychecks were deposited and see if any are missing. See if they're all high enough. There's for most people, there's a, a predictable amount of pay every time they get a paycheck. It's, you know, easy to break it down that way when you've got them highlighted and you can just count up how many checks were there. Wow, that's a great tip. Yeah, it, it's it takes some tenacity and stick with itness, but I think it's for the right reasons to really make sure that you are clear on all the information that you have. Because if you're going through a divorce and you sign off, you can't go back. Right. I think that getting your arms around the financial situation at divorce time seems really intimidating, which is why I wanted to approach it in a very methodical way. I put the divorce money guide together in 10 steps, which by the way, you don't have to do all the steps. You, If you wanted to pick and choose a couple of steps, you could do that. But I walk you through very methodically because I feel like if you take it in little bites, it's a mm -hmm. lot more manageable. Yeah, definitely. Just little stepping stones to get yourself there. So how do we get this divorce money guide? 
Well, you can go to divorcemoneyguide.com and there it is. You can follow me on Instagram. My handle there is, of course, Divorce Money Guide. Awesome. And so I feel like we've covered a ton of great information today from, you know, financial abuse, what is forensic accounting anyways, and, you know, part of this divorce as well. Um, Do you have any other parting thoughts, tips, or tricks for our listeners today? Your best way to protect yourself, whether you are getting divorced or not, is to have information in your hands. Knowledge is power. So start gathering information. That is your best first step, no matter where you are in your marriage. Very good advice. And um, I think we will end it right there, Tracy. Thank you so much for your expertise, for your insights, for sharing what you do day in and day out, and for the Divorce Money Guide, which I think everybody should grab a copy of if they're going through divorce, can't hurt. And as you know, Tracy is one of our Purse Strings Approved Professionals. You can also find her at PurseStrings.co. We're so glad to have her in our community. And um, that's it for now. Until next time, be financially fearless. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action. The Institute for Divorce Financial Analysts, IDFA, is a proud sponsor of Purse Strings. IDFA is the premier organization dedicated to the certification, education, and promotion of the use of financial professionals in the divorce arena. IDFA provides specialized training to accounting, financial, and legal professionals in the field of pre-divorce financial planning. To find out more about earning the Certified Divorce Financial Analyst designation, visit InstituteDFA.com.